shall rise up to pray. Our Father, we thank you for your spirit leading and guiding us, teaching and instructing us, reminding us of Christ our Savior, our Lord, our Redeemer. Lord, we pray that grace should appropriate everything Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary. Grant to everyone in Jesus' name. As we keep on living, keep on singing, keep on preaching about the Redeemer, so that it will not just be those of us who are here that will know, that will hear, that will learn, that will receive of the riches of grace from Calvary. But Lord, people beyond, people around, they will hear, they will benefit in Jesus' name. Reveal more of your redemption to us, more of your grace to us, more of your strength to us, that, Lord, we will minister with knowledge, with understanding, with experience, what you have done for us on the cross of Calvary. Keep us awake as we learn from your word right now. In Jesus' name we pray. The church of the church is awake. Amen. God bless you. You can sit down. We're coming to Romans chapter 3. Already you know that in Romans chapters 1 and 2, the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, led by God, taught by Christ, inspired by the Spirit, has already shown that the Jews and the Gentiles are sinners. And that we need the grace of God, the free-flowing grace of God, to bring us to what Christ has provided. In this chapter, it's not going to begin our justification story. It's going to tell us about the grace of God. It's going to tell us about the faith that appropriates that grace. And it's going to tell us the result of Calvary, how Christ has become our Redeemer. Justification by grace through faith. There are preachers that tell us that they only preach grace. They only preach love. They only preach the good news. And that looks uh, fine on the surface. Until you come back to the scriptures. As we look at the scriptures, the scriptures make us to understand you must show the problem before you bring the solution. And you must reveal that man is lost in sin before you bring the love of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God. And look at what Paul the Apostle is doing here. Number one is reminding us in chapter 3 that all have sinned. Look at verse 23. It says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's good to talk about grace, but you must start there. And he's telling us, look at verse 14 of that, um, of that, of this um, chapter. It says, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. He must show man his rottenness, his depravity, his defilement, and the doom and the damnation that's upon him. Look at verse 4. It says, God forbid. But let God be true and every man a liar. It's going to show that first of all, before he gives you the love of God and the grace of God and the compassion of God, he says, every man a liar. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, what then? Are we better than they? Are we Jews better than the Gentiles? No, in no wise. For we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all sinners, that they are all under sin. 
And then he says, anybody righteous, he must still first of all bring them to condemnation before he brings them, the, the, before he brings to them the compassion of the Lord. Look at verse 10, as it is written, there is not righteous, no, not one. In fact, it's going to tell us that the whole world of the Gentiles and the Jews, that they're all guilty in the sight of God. Look at verse 19. In verse 19, now we know that what things so Ever the Lord says, it says to them that are under the Lord, look at this, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world guilty before God. So the people that tell us we're talking about grace, we're talking about mercy, we're never talking about sin, we must talk about sin. Because if you don't talk about the sickness, the healing virtue will not be appreciated. If you don't talk about the damnation, the salvation will not be appreciated. Look at verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. After he has done that, he now wants to tell us. The benefit that's available for all, both for the Jews and for the Gentiles. Number one, it talks about the faith or the faithfulness of God. Look at verse 3. In verse 3 it says, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith, the faithfulness of God without effect? It talks about the faithfulness of God. And then it talks about the righteousness of God. It says God is righteous. Look at verse 5. In verse 5 of chapter 3, For if our righteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who take vengeance as speak as a man? Come to verse 21, the righteousness of God. In verse 21, it says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And then it talks about the truth of God. Look at verse 7. In verse 7 it says, For if the truth of God has more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And it talks about the glory of God. Verse 23. In verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It talks about the forbearance of God. Look at verse 25. It tells us whom God has set forth a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of the sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. God. And so you see what Paul is doing is talking about God. He's talking about his faithfulness. And he's talking about his truthfulness. He's talking about his righteousness. He's talking about his glory. He's talking about his forbearance. And now he talks about his righteousness, which we cannot attain by ourselves, but we can obtain. And we can retain. And it can be sustained. And it can be maintained. And all by the Spirit of God. So he comes now to talk about our justification by grace through faith. We're dividing this chapter to three parts. Number one, the revelation of the faithfulness of God. The revelation of the faithfulness of God. Number two, the recognition of man's filthiness before God. The recognition of man's filthiness before God. Number three, the righteousness through faith and God's grace. The righteousness through faith and God's grace. Look at number one. In number one, the revelation of the faithfulness of God. It's telling us and showing us. It's revealing to us and guiding us to the very fact that God is faithful. Whatever the Jews have become. Whatever the Israelites have become, and whatever their attitude might have been to the covenant of God, to the provision of God, and to the thing that he made, the covenant we made with their fathers, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and with the whole of the nation Israel, whatever they have done, whatever they have left undone, God is faithful. The revelation of the faithfulness of God. We're coming to uh, chapter 3, verse 1. What advantage then? As the Jew, 
or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way. It's like, if you understand this, it's like a dialogue between a Jew and Paul the Apostle. He's representing a Jew on one side. The Jew has listened to him in chapter 2. And he has said, your circumcision was nothing. Your circumcision has become uncircumcision. The circumcision of the flesh is worthless and without profit because you are a breaker of the law. And then he, he pictures the Jew coming out and asking him, Ah, Paul, what advantage then has the Jew? The Jew is now asking, What profit is there of circumcision? And now Paul is reminding him, and Paul is answering the verse two much every way. Chiefly because that unto them are committed the oracles of God. Uh -huh. If you say so, the Jew is coming back now, and the Jew is saying, For what if some did not believe? Shall the unbelief make the face of God of none effect? The Jew is asking him, What if some do not believe? All the pictures you are painting in chapter 2, and you say, Some have denied him. Some say they are teachers and they are not obeying what they teach. And they say they are instructors of the foolish and yet they are not complying with the word. What if some of us, the Jews, did not believe? Will the unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Paul is going to answer, God forbid, yea. Let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou might be justified in thy sins and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Okay, then, if you say that the God is still faithful, the Jew is coming back now and the Jew is asking him a question. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say to that? You say that God's purpose is still on target. You say that he raised up Abraham and then all the fathers and now Jesus Christ has come. You know, he has made use of everything that we did. Our righteousness has commended his righteousness. Then is God the righteous who take vengeance? Is now Paul is asking that man. Who is a Jew? Is God righteous? Who takes a judgment? Your benches? I speak as a man. God forbid. For then, how shall God judge the world? And now, the conclusion of that section it says, For if the truth of God has more abounded through my lie unto his glory, yet, why yet am I judged as a sinner? It says, If the truth of God more abounded through my life unto his glory why yet am i also judged as a sinner the jew is saying you are telling me about the foreknowledge of god about the forbearance of god about the faithfulness of god and you're telling me that all the same the jews have missed the point okay if we jews have been unrighteous if we jews have been unfaithful and God has made use of our unrighteousness. And now he has established his righteousness. Why will God judge me? After all, I've even helped him to fulfill his will. It's like Judas Iscariot asking, If my betrayal has now led Jesus to the cross, and has made Jesus to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 3 and many other prophecies. And now he has borne our sins. And through my betraying Christ, Christ has now become the savior of the world. And multitudes have been saved. Why will God judge me as a sinner? And the answer will come to Judas Iscariot. You are a sinner. Your mind was not to fulfill the purpose of God. God turned your betrayal, your unfaithfulness, your sin, your covetousness. God overruled and still made Christ to fulfill his will. But you'll still be judged for your sin. You see in verse 8, there are people that will make the wrong conclusion. And not, and not rather, as we be slanderously reported, slanderously reported, as some affirm that we say, let us do evil. 
that good may come. Whose damnation is just. You see that God has always turned the evil of man in his own plan to something eventually that brings redemption. Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit. Immediately the prophecy came that the seed of the woman will come and bruise the head of the devil. That doesn't justify Adam and Eve. Adam was still driven out. Eve was still driven out of the garden of Eden. And Judas has got betrayed Jesus Christ. He did evil. God turned everything in the right way. And now we have the redemption of the world. That does not justify Judas Iscariot. It was better he were not born. The apostles, they neglected the great commission that you receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you'll be witnesses on both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. They refused to do that. And because of that, persecution came. And that persecution now scattered them throughout the places they should have gone to preach the gospel. Something good came out of that. That does not justify the persecutors. The persecutors are still under the judgment of God. And so we cannot say, let us do evil that good may be the result. If you do evil, God still has a way of bringing good out of it, but that does not justify you. He's talking about the revelation of the faithfulness of God. Come back to verse 1. What advantage then as the Jew? What profit is there of circumcision? It says, much in every way. Much in every way. What's the advantage? And what is the profit? We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. We're reading from verse 7. Deuteronomy chapter 4. And we're reading here from verse 7. In verse 7 it says, For what nation is there so great? Who has God so near unto them? As the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for. And what nation is there so great that has statutes and judgment so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? It was revealing to them. See what God has done. He's given us the oracles of God, the doctrines of the Bible, and the righteousness established from heaven. It says that's the advantage of the Jews. They were the people that uh, had the word of God, and the word of God has now been made available to the rest of the world. That's advantageous on their side. It was a good thing if they are taking advantage of that. Psalm 78. In Psalm 78, reading from verse 5, for he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children that the generation to come might know them even the children which should be born who should arise and declare to them them to their children that they might set their hope in god and not forget the works of god but keep his commandments. He says that's the advantage of the Jews because they add the word of God. It tells us in Psalm 147, Psalm 147, reading from verse 19, he showed his word unto Jacob. That was the advantage. That was their profit. He showed his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. He has not dealt so with any other nation. And as for this, for his judgments, they have not known them, praise the Lord. And so you see, that's what Paul the Apostle was saying. He said, yes, it's all right that you're a Jew. It's all right that you're a Jew, but make use of the advantage. He has given us the oracles of God. And then he says in chapter 3, verse 3, Romans, What for what, if some did not believe, shall the unbelief make the faith of God without effect? It's asking, they're asking a question. What if some do not believe? Shall the unbelief make the faith of God of none effect? Verse 4, God forbid, God forbid. Look at the actions of God. He gave Joseph a dream. And he said he will rule over his uh, brothers. 
What if some of them did not believe? And what if they said, here comes a dreamer. Let us kill him so that uh, we'll see what will become of his dream. And God overruled that. And eventually, that dream was still fulfilled. Even if some do not believe, God will still fulfill his word. His promises are yes and amen. It will be done in your life. It will be done in our lives. It will be done in our church in Jesus' name. In 2 Timothy, we're looking at chapter 2, verse 12. 2 Timothy, chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 12. 2 Timothy, chapter 2. We're reading from verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he am I that faithful. He cannot deny himself. If we believe not, he abides faithful. Because he cannot deny himself is the righteous one. And that's the reason why he's now asking that men will repent. Because if they do not repent, you will still perform his will. You will still get the glory. You will still establish his kingdom. And there will still be millions and trillions of people in that kingdom. Uncountable number of people in that kingdom. Only the people that do not believe will be denied entrance into that kingdom. What are we to do then? It tells us in Acts chapter 17 verse 31. Acts chapter 17. Let's read from verse 30. At the times of this ignorance, God winked at but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. You see that he wants all men to repent so that they can get to the kingdom. If they don't, they won't get into the kingdom. But they are the losers. God will still be faithful because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. Let's come to point number two. The recognition of man's filthiness before God. Here Paul the apostle was going to now show the Jewish people and the gentle people to force the Jewish people. God is not surprised by your reaction. God is not surprised by your rebellion. God is not surprised by your unrighteousness. If you read the Old Testament, you will see he knew that this is what you will be, but God is still God. And then to the Gentile people, he's still going to say the same thing. You cannot rejoice over the Jews because you're all in the same boat. All I've seen that come short of the glory of God, the recognition of man's filthiness before God. We're reading from verse 9. Chapter 3, verse 9. What then? Are we better than they, Jewish people? You have the records of God. You have the commandments of God. And you have all the plans of God in your hand, in your head, in your mind. Are we better? Are we Jews better than the Gentiles? No, in no wise. For we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Jesus Christ always referred the people to the scriptures, Old Testament. What have you read? How did you read? What did you read in the Old Testament? And now Paul the Apostle is saying, as it is written, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Where is that written? We're looking at Psalm 14. Psalm 14, we're reading here from verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there's no God. The fool has lived his life as if there were no God. The church boy is living his life as if there is no judge, there is no God, there is no, there's the most holy, the high one, the almighty, does not see, does not think about what I do. He says they are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looketh down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that, that, that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. 
no not one in psalm 53 the same thing is repeated for emphasis psalm 53 we're reading here from verse 1 the fool has said in his heart you may not say it aloud i'm here nobody knows what i'm doing even god does not know there's no god corrupt are they and they have done abominable iniquity there is none that doeth good god looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand that this see God, every one of them is gone back, they all together become filthy, the filthiness of man before God. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And it goes on in Romans chapter 3, reading from verse 11. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. As we look at nations in Africa, nations beyond Africa, and you find people running and running to meetings and they're running to camps and they're running to conventions and they're running to night BG, they're running to all these uh, programs. You say, are they not seeking God? Uh-uh. They're seeking what God might give them. They're seeking for bread and butter. They're not seeking God. They're seeking for money, prosperity. They're not seeking God. They're seeking for promotion. They're not seeking. They're seeking for how to destroy and kill their enemies. They're not seeking God. They're seeking God for what he will give. Are you like that? You're seeking after this and this and that. You're seeking the gift, not the giver. It says there is none that understand it. There's none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable, unprofitable to God, unprofitable to the nation, unprofitable to the kingdom of God, unprofitable to their family, unprofitable to themselves. There is none that would good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues, they have used the seed. The poison of asp is under their leaves, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatsoever things the Lord saith, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth, every mouth, every mouth, church goer and not church goer alike, every mouth may be stopped, and all the world become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And so you see what the apostle is saying, he's saying, without grace, there's no just person. Without conversion, there's no righteous person. Without regeneration, there's no right fellow. Without cleansing, without God's transforming power, and without Christ's purging grace, without the Spirit's liberation, man is filthy, man is unclean, man is defiled, man is defiling, man is corrupt. Without the help of God, man is rotten, man is putrid, man is polluted, man is abominable. Without the grace of God and the transforming power of that grace, man is guilty, man is condemned, man is punishable, man is damned. It's revealing to us that whether you are Jew or Gentile, whether you are a church goer or not a church goer, whether you read the Bible or you don't read the Bible, if the grace of God does not flow into our lives, it says there's nothing we can do. First of all, we must have forgiveness from Him. And then He must set us free. He must wash us. He must cleanse us. He must justify us. He must adopt us into His family. He must make us acceptable to God and absolved from judgment. And it must come by grace. That's why he tells us that this for everyone, anyone that is born, if a woman, we're looking at Job chapter 15. Job chapter 15. We're reading from verse 14. 
It says, this is a nature. This is a lie. And this is who we are without grace. Job chapter 15, reading from verse 14. What is man? That he should be clean. And he which is born of a woman, that he should be righteous. It takes the grace of God to come in. The combating power of God to come in before we can be righteous. Job chapter 25, verse 4. Job chapter 25, verse 4. How then can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? A Jew born of a woman, a Gentile born of a woman, a church goer born of a woman, a non church goer born of a woman, a highly placed person born of a woman, a lowly fellow born of a woman. How can that man be justified with God? How can he be clean that is born of a woman? It has to be by the grace of God. You see, all these Jews, all these Israelites who are pumping up themselves and who are saying, We're all right, and because we're circumcised, I say, I told them, they were not listening. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1, reading from verse 4 A sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, they're Jews. A seed of evil dwell, this were Jews, children of corruptors, and children that are corruptors that have forsaken the Lord. And they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. These were Jews. And these were people that prided themselves in where this, where that. Without grace, what could you be? Without his favor, what could you be? And without his mercy, what could you be? Without Calvary, what could you be? Why should he be stricken anymore? He will revolt more and more. The whole land is sick. And the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and fortified sores that they, they have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. And your cities are bought with fire. Your land strangers devour it in your presence. It is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in the vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers and a besieged city, except the Lord of hosts has left unto us a very small remnant, which should have been as Sodom and which should have been like unto Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you realize of Sodom. And give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? They, they were coming and they were saying, we are special people. We know how to seek the face of the Lord. And we offer sacrifices. He said, but to what purpose? To what purpose? He says to them, says the Lord, I am full of burnt offerings and of rams and the fat of fed bees. I delight not in the blood of the bullocks or of the lambs of the eagles when you come to appear before me who has required this at your hand to tread my cause bring no more vain oblation incense and abomination to me the new moons and the sabbaths the calling of assemblies i cannot away with it is iniquity even the solemn meetings these were the things the you know they rejoiced in where the people of god is giving us all these ceremonies all these rites all these rituals and all this circumcision all the sabbath and then it says to them your new moons in verse 14 and your appointed feast my soul haters they trouble unto me i am weary to bear them and when you spread your hands when you spread forth your hands i will not i will hide my eyes from you yea when you make many prayers i will not hear your hands are full of blood and i start told them but these people they never listened they were still sick where jews were circumcised where the people of god were better than the gentiles now he told them what to do wash you and make you clean 
put away the evil of your deeds from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. And then after that, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Do your sins be as scarlet? They shall be as white as snow. Do they be red like crimson? They shall be as well. He was telling them the only hope is the forgiveness of God. The only hope is the cleansing of the Lord. The only hope is the Christ, the Messiah, the Redeemer that will come. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 6. Isaiah chapter 53. And we're reading at it in verse 6. This is the only hope of the Jew, of the Gentile. In chapter 53 verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. Jewish people, all we like sheep have gone astray. Church goers, all we like sheep have gone astray. Religious people, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's our only hope. The Lord has laid on him, on Christ our Redeemer, the iniquity of us all. In Ezekiel chapter 36, Ezekiel chapter 36, the prophets were faithful to give them the promise and to tell them, this is our only hope. All this circumcision and all this pride of being religious, that will not uh, coach uh, anything in the sight of the Lord. It tells us in Ezekiel chapter 36, Verse 25, then will I sprinkle clear water upon you, and you shall be clean. It's my work. You cannot do it by yourself. I will sprinkle clean water upon you. It's not the work of the high priest. It's not the work of the lawgiver. It's not the work of the Levite. It's not the work of your hand. I myself will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. And from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. In your heart will I give unto you. Come to me. I'm the one to do it. I'm the one to save you. I'm the one to turn your lives around. It is not what religion can do. Their prophets told them over and over. And the word of God is telling us over and over. It's not the work of our heart. It's the work of his love. In your heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. He will do it. I said he will do it. He says, and I will put my spirit within you. What a wonderful privilege we have. And cause you to walk in my statutes. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. I pray the promise of God be yes and amen in our lives, in your life, in my life, in Jesus' name. But you know something about these Jewish people? With all they heard, with all they saw, look at Proverbs chapter 30, verse 12. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 12. There is a generation that appear in their own eyes, and yet... Is not washed from their filthiness. And Jesus said, Ye will not come to me that ye might be healed and converted. A generation of people that thought the works of their hands were enough. I pray you will not be part of that generation. Let him cleanse you. Let him wash you. And then you give all the glory of a justification to him. All the glory of your righteousness to him. All the glory of your redemption unto him and him alone. Point number three. The righteousness through faith and God's grace. The righteousness through faith and God's grace. It tells us in Romans chapter 3, reading from verse 21. But now, the righteousness of God without the law. Is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Look at that. The righteousness of God without the law of Moses. The righteousness of the law without the ceremonies of the law. That is of the old Mosaic law. That righteousness is manifested, 
being witnessed by the law and the prophets. You need to understand that now. The law and the prophets, that's uh, a language or that's the term that is used for the Old Testament. The law and the prophets. What does this mean? Witnessed by the law and the prophets. Witnessed by the promises given in the Pentateuch. Is witnessed by the promise that we have in Genesis. That's part of the law that says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, and between the seed and the seed. And then you'll bruise his heel, he'll bruise your head. Is witnessed by the law. What does that mean? Exodus, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. It witnessed by the law in Leviticus when it says, The blood, have I given you an atonement for your soul? It is witnessed by the law. Look at numbers there, and it says, As the serpent is lifted up, even so shall the Son of Man be lifted up, so that as you look on him, whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life it is witnessed by the law and then you go through all the old testament it is witnessed by the prophets too we've read isaiah already we've read jeremiah we've read ezekiel and the other prophets the righteousness of the law is then fulfilled by the prophecies and the promises they gave we're looking at verse 22 even the righteousness of god which is by faith of jesus of jesus christ unto all and upon all them that believe for there is no difference it's brought the Jew and the Gentile now to the same place number one to the same place of guilt number two to the same place of grace number three to the same place of godliness the only way through grace is through grace to godliness and then to glory both for the Jew and the Gentile for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God he said if we have the same sickness if the Jew has the same sickness, disease as the Gentile, it is the same solution, the same medication that will save them. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Jew, are you coming? Come without anything in your hand because it will justify you freely. Gentile, are you coming? Come, nothing in your hand because it will justify you freely. It tells us in verse 25 whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Our sins that are passed, it doesn't give us justification for the sins that are future. It doesn't say, I give you forgiveness for the sins that are of the future. It doesn't give us a freedom, license for sins of the future. But he has given us remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time is righteousness, that he may be just and the justifier of him, Jew or Gentile, which believeth in Jesus. Where is the boasting then? It's excluded by what law? Of what? Nay, but the law of faith. The just shall live by faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only because of circumcision? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Of the Gentiles also. Seen, it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and your circumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith, Paul? I mean, Jew, are you telling us that the law is completely worthless because of faith? Do you mean that we can throw the commandments of God away? And now we can do whatever we want because faith has come in. And you're telling us that the law is nothing. So you mean we can have another God as God and God will not mind? 
Do you mean we can make a caricature of God and make an idol representation of God? Do you mean we don't have to honor the Lord's day? Do you mean we can take the law of God, the name of God in vain now? Okay, but what you're saying is that we have come to faith and because we have come to faith, we don't have to honor our father and our mother that our days will be long on the earth. Paul, you are telling us that now faith has come. The law is useless. That means we can steal. That means we can be covetous. That means we can commit adultery. That means that we can bear false witness against our neighbor. Do you make, do we make void the law of God through faith? He says, God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. No, we're not making void of the law. What we're saying is that you don't have the strength by yourself to obey the law of God. But now you come through faith. As you come through faith, it forgives you. As you come through faith, it sets you free. As you come through faith, it makes you a new creature in Christ. As you come through faith, it gives you salvation. And Jesus Christ now gives you the power to do what you could not do by yourself before. I'm only telling you, you are powerless before faith comes in. You are hopelessly unrighteous before faith comes in. Resolution cannot do it. Determination cannot do it. And the human exertion of the will will fail to make man righteous until he relies and rests on the Savior. What I'm saying is a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus saves. Come put your faith in Christ. Jesus liberates. Come put your faith in Christ. Jesus cleanses. Come and put your faith in Christ. Jesus transforms. Come and put your faith in Christ. Jesus redeems. Come and put your faith in Christ. And Jesus will empower you to keep the law of God and be victorious which you couldn't keep before. We're not, making, we're not making void the law of God. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Come to Jesus. Jesus receives. He receives every sinner. Jesus restores. He will restore you back to the original righteousness. Jesus regenerates. He will create in you again the new heart and restore you to the original stage of a righteous man. Jesus reconciles. It's by faith. It's not the law. It's not the circumcision. It will restore you and reconcile you unto the Lord. Jesus recreates. It will recreate your nature. He recreates your inner man. Jesus renews. He renews your life. He refreshes your life. Jesus reigns. He will reign over everything that has ruled over you. We make, we establish the law of God through that faith. Thank God for that faith. I say thank God for that faith. Because of that faith, you are saved. Because of that faith, you are sanctified. Because of that faith, your life is turned around. Because of that faith, you are out of darkness. Because of that faith, you are now in the light. Because of that faith, heaven is your final home. Let's, let's rise up and thank the Lord for that grace. Thank God for that grace. What he has done. What he has done that no other person can do. What he has done. What he has given that no other person can give. What he has accomplished that no other person can accomplish. By grace you saved through faith. And that not of yourself. It is the gift of God.